many a time in, in my life, I'm sure you've had similar experiences, where you've come to a circumstance, uh, an, uh, an event, an accomplishment, something you've been aiming at, something you've wanted for a long time, something you've aimed at, and, and then you've charged at it, and you've come to your accomplishment, and then you've come past it, and, and the thought is, well, now what? Climbing mountains, 14,000 feet. And then you come back to the base. Now what? Uh, entering into some contest and studying and preparing and, and, and doing all that you can to get ready for the contest and coming and then finishing whatever that contest is, that feat, and you've finished it, and then what? There's a sense in which when we come to Exodus chapter 20, which we'll be looking at this evening with Deuteronomy chapter 5. When we come to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 18, we've come over the mountain. We're still at the base of the mountain. We're still at Sinai in the history of Israel. But there's a sense in which we've come over the peak. This, was, this is what they were aiming at. Remember, they had been in bondage for 400 plus years. And God had come and redeemed them. And God had delivered them by a mighty power that had never been seen in the world before. And then God took them and brought them to himself. And then he came down upon that mountain and spoke to them. And we've been looking at his uh, ten words that he spoke from the mountain to his people. Well, now having redeemed and brought and spoken to his people, the question is, what next? What, what more should we expect? What more should they do? Well, I want to look tonight at, at verses uh, 18 to 21 of Exodus chapter 20, which is a transition between what has taken place and what is about to take place. And I want to look at this verse under three very simple heads. What they perceived, what they proposed, and what they received. What they perceived, what they proposed, and what they received. First of all, verse 18 of Exodus chapter 20. And all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. This is what the people perceived. They have some fearful manifestations. Some things which have uh, we've seen before back in chapter 19, verses 16 through 18, a, a similar description was given when they came to the mountain and they were called after the third day to come up to the mountain but not to touch it. And we read. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and thick cloud upon the mountains and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. These are the experiences, the things which they saw, the manifestations of, of what was happening there at the mountain as they came. Now, as we look at the manifestations, they fall into two categories. Again, going back to verse 18 of chapter 20. Things which they heard and things which they saw. Now, notice with me, first of all, that it says that they heard thunder. They perceived thunder. Literally, they saw thunder. Now, none of us has ever seen thunder. We've seen lightning. We've seen the, what causes the thunder. Maybe we've seen the effects of the wind that attend the thunder. And so the word see here is obviously a very broad word. They experienced, right? This is a, a 4D theater, if you will. They're going to experience some things here. They're going to have some perceptions. And part of what they perceived was this thunder. The word is literally voice. They heard a voice. Now, it was not any voice. It was a thunderous voice. It was a powerful voice that spoke to them 
from the darkness. It was a voice with real content that they could really understand. They heard the words which we've been looking at for 50 sermons. They heard those words spoken to them on that day. They were not in a foreign language. They were not in in unutterable uh, tongues. It was not cloudy. It was clear. The voice came and the words were perceived and they understood what was being said. Associated or going along with that was also this trumpet blast. Now I have yet to find anywhere where it tells me who's blowing the trumpet. It could have been an angel. It could have just been a noise that God himself was creating out of nowhere. It could have been that he had told Moses and Moses had, had put some people in place. But I think all of this is coming from God. I don't think there's any human effort in this. But here's this trumpet blast. Now trumpet blasts don't mean a whole lot to us. At least I don't hear a whole lot of trumpet blasts on a daily basis. I'm not... Uh, listening for that, but they, they understood something of what this was, and, and even more so if you, if you understand the scriptures, trumpet blasts were used among the people of Israel in particular to call the people to assemble. It was the bell, the second bell, not the first one, between classes, the first one which ends the first class, and the second one, boy, that's when you're supposed to be in class. It's time to assemble. This was a big bell, a big blast to come and to assemble and they would assemble for one of two reasons they would either assemble to go out to war because they were under attack or they would assemble to worship now there's nothing in this passage that would tell the people what to expect now maybe they they should have known that something of what has been going on with Moses going up the mountain and down the mountain and telling them to come to the mountain that they should have probably expected that this meant to come and worship But nevertheless, it was a fearful sound because it got louder and louder and louder. And it continued, it seems, even after the words were spoken, after this voice was was given, it seems that there was still this sound of the trumpet. But then there's also what they saw. And it says here that they saw in the New American Standard, they saw lightning flashes. Again, the Hebrew word is a little simpler. It's just torch which is actually very helpful because the word torch is not used very often uh, in, in, the, in the Old Testament. This is the same word used for Gideon. Actually, trumpets and torches are used for Gideon. Remember when he went down to battle against the Midianites? And they had their torches under their pitchers, and they had their trumpets in the other hand, and they were about to go. And what was, what was the purpose of those torches? Well, it was to give the sense that there's a whole lot of people here. There's a whole lot of people coming against them with this sound and with the, tr- with the torches. It's also used to describe the fire that came out of Leviathan's nostrils. Remember that big beast that Job describes? And part of the picture there is this fire that's coming out of them. It's a, ho- it's, it's a, it's a frightening picture when you try to put the whole thing together. It's also used to describe something of of Ezekiel's vision. Remember he saw the, the, the vision of the likeness of the appearance of the glory of the Lord? And part of that was this torch. Now there it actually says it was a, it was a torch that bounced back and forth. So there's something of, of the, the nature of lightning going on there. But I also want you to pick up on the way this is used in Daniel chapter 10. And I'm just trying to give you a picture. What is it they actually saw there? What is it that was actually going on? There's, there's Fire, and yet there's darkness. And there's this incredible noise, and there's this voice. But in Daniel chapter 10, in verse 6, the same word is used, but it's used to describe a person. A person much like was read in Revelation chapter 1 this evening. His body, Daniel 10 and verse 6, His body also was like burl. His face had the appearance of the torch. His eyes were like, or excuse me, of of lightning, and and his eyes were like the flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of burnished bronze. The sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Sounds pretty thunderous that his voice was. Gives you some sense as to what Daniel must have seen and what Daniel must have feared when this angel came into his presence, or 
the angel of the Lord came into his presence to speak to him. But this is what they saw. And with that, they saw this thick smoke. Or as, the, as Deuteronomy paints it, there is this cloud, this, this darkness that's there. There's smoke rising up from the mountain. Now, this smoke is also an interesting word. It's a, it's a smoke that's used for a furnace. It's what Abraham saw after Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed. And he went and saw what was probably something like a, a, a nuclear wasteland. When fire and brimstone had come down out of heaven and consumed those wicked cities, and he saw the smoke of the furnace rising up. This was not your typical little campfire smoke. This was dark, thick, black, fearful smoke. This darkness, this smoking furnace, or excuse me, this smoking uh, that took place there is, is used to speak of God. In Psalm 18 and verse 8, when God comes, he comes in the clouds, in the smoke, to deal with his enemies, to defend his people. In Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 5, it's a manifestation of God's glorious protecting presence among his people, this smoking, fiery cloud that's over his people. And similarly, we'll come back to this later in Joel chapter 2, the same language is used to describe God coming. And he comes and there is great smoke. It was a fearful day. The things that they saw, the things that they heard, these manifestations impacted them to the point where they trembled. They trembled. Add to that what Moses had told them, you don't touch the mountain. If you touch the mountain then they were either supposed to be shot through with an arrow or stoned on the spot. Nobody was even supposed to touch them. It was a fearful day. And so they trembled. And the word tremble is used in numbers of ways just to get a sense. It's, it's the way that Hannah's lips quivered when she was praying, but no words were coming out of her mouth. It's used to describe the staggering walk of a, of a drunken man who, who, who can't get his his feet quite under him, and he's, and he's trembling. He's, he's going to fall at any moment. Interestingly, it's used to describe Cain. Cain described himself as a vagrant and a wanderer, one who was trembling, one who was kind of lost his way and, and wandering around, almost as though the, the ground underneath him was, was shifting. It's used in Numbers chapter 32 and verse 13, to describe the people of God. And here it's, it's, it's not so much that the per they trembled, but they are caused to wander. I wonder if there isn't, the picture is, is something like them standing at the edge of the mountain and, and, and they're, they're just getting a little bit antsy and, 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 and the, the noise keeps getting a little, little bit louder and, and maybe their feet are shuffling and, and, and maybe they're backing up a little bit, but there's just this, there's this, this uncertainty about what's going on here. There's a, They've been shaken by what they've heard and by what they've seen. And this is no small thing. What they perceive, they perceive these fearful manifestations, but there's something more here. If I can say it this way without being too trite, there's more than what meets the eye. And we see that in, De in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So if you look back over to Deuteronomy chapter 5, in verse 24, we realize that there's something else going on here. Moses, recalling to a second generation what it was like on that day and describing the darkness, describing the voice, describing the burning fire, describing what, was, what had taken place, he says, here was the response of the people. He says, you said, behold... The Lord God has shown us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. And we have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he lives. These were not only fearful manifestations, they were revelatory manifestations. 
They were meant to display to the people, to declare to the people some truths. And the, the people of God picked up on this. They interpreted these things as manifestations of God's special presence. God came down specially on that mountain, and they perceived in all that was taking place there, God's glory, an outshining of his attributes, and his greatness, something of that which sets him apart from all of his creatures. Now when it says that they saw his glory, they've seen the glory of God before. And they associate it with something that has been said before, not too long ago. If you turn back just a few chapters to Exodus chapter 16, is the, is the, the next place, the previous place where this word glory has been mentioned. We read in Exodus 16 and verse 7. Well, let's read verse 6. Get Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? He says, you are going to see something of God manifesting his presence to you. And that glory was manifested in part in the manna. God caring for them. God not, not coming in judgment, but coming in, in kindness and grace and, and ministering to them. And we read down further, if you follow along down a little bit, verse 9, Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumblings. And it came about as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Now here, they saw something of the display of God's presence in the clouds. Maybe it was shining. Maybe it was a brightness. But they saw something that manifested God has drawn close to us. So when they saw all these things going on, they recognized God was manifesting himself to them. God was displaying himself to them. They understood on that particular day, when they came close to that mountain, they were coming close to God. The true God, the living God, the God of heaven and earth. It says in Deuteronomy, it describes him as the God of heaven and earth. And that's interesting language because remember what has happened. Well, the sky has got darkness in it. The mountain is shaking. He's already shown himself to be a God who, 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 understand, who oversees all of the animal kingdom Right? When, he, when he brought them out of Egypt, he has control of flies and gnats and frogs. He has control over water. He can turn it to blood if he wants to. He can part it and make it stand on end if he wants to. He can bring it in at will. He is the God who can make things so dark that it's, that it's palpable, that it's, that it's touchable almost. It's so dark. He can blot out the sun. He's the God who rules over all creation. And this is the God that they're drawing near to at this mountain. This is the God who has, has drawn near to them and come down on this mountain and is manifesting himself right in their presence. You see, they saw this and this was no man's trick. This was no mere storm. No natural phenomenon that, that they just couldn't explain and somehow it happened that this unusual storm wrapped itself around the mountain and they happened to be standing there. And if anybody thought that, we have no record of this, but if anybody thought that and walked up to the mountain and said, I'm, I'll show you. They either were shot through by a faithful Israelite, they were stoned by some faithful Israelite, or God himself did, did dealt with them. But the fact of the matter is they saw God's glory. This was a display of his greatness. And when they heard that thunder, they understood what that was. That was a voice. That was the voice of God. Jehovah spoke to them, he sa they say. The covenant God, the one true God, not all those gods of Egypt. The real God, the one who actually speaks. This was a sobering, challenging, important day 
And it's manifested because of all the, the various manifestations that they were seeing on that day. And that voice spoke to them. That voice spoke to them some brief yet extensive directions regarding how they were to relate to him and how they were to relate to one another. And you know, it was clear there was no negotiating going on. Somebody didn't put up their hand in the middle and say, oh, you know, number five bothers me. Uh, can, we, can, we, can we modify that slightly? This was God speaking. This was power speaking. And, and you know, when they were all said and done, it says that they marveled that they were still alive. You know, people don't just hear voices every day coming out of the fire and out of the cloud saying, I am Jehovah, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You don't hear that every day. And, and they knew somebody else who had conversations with God, at least through Moses and Aaron, and he didn't fare too well. You know, Pharaoh is still pretty, pretty fresh in their minds and what God did to Pharaoh and what God did to all of his chariots that chased them down. No, they marveled that they were still alive because they had seen what this God could do. But then there's, there's actually more going on here than meets the eye because there's some very interesting and unique words here. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, you'll recall, is God coming to Abraham to confirm his covenant with Abraham. Genesis chapter 15, verses 17 and 18. Notice the, some of the parallels here. And it came about when the sun had set, darkness, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven, same word as torch, Excuse me, I'm getting my words. Fl smoking oven, same word as the smoking that was taking place, and a flaming torch, same word as torch or lightning, as translated in Exodus 20, which passed between the pieces. On that day, Jehovah, same name as is being used at Mount Sinai, made a covenant with Abram, saying, This voice is speaking again. To your descendants I have given the land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. You see, the whole passage in, in Exodus chapter 20, after they come down the mountain, is made for us to stop and say, God is drawing near in covenant practice. This is covenant language. He's coming to make covenant with these people, to draw them together as his people, and he is setting himself as their God. It's seen in the pictures, as I've mentioned. It's seen in the words that are described here. God is drawing close to them, but not like we read in Isaiah. Very similar picture there in Isaiah. But when that picture of God drawing near came near to Isaiah, and when Isaiah viewed what God was doing, that terrified him, and he began to cry out for forgiveness. You can understand then why these people have something of a, of a hesitation at what's happening in front of them. And yet God hasn't come in judgment. God has come in grace. God has drawn near to them to covenant with them. That's what they perceived. And they perceived something of that covenant language, covenant realities. But then secondly what they proposed, what they proposed. Verse 19 of Exodus chapter 20. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us lest we die. Same words or the, 
described differently in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 27 and to 28. Now then, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of Jehovah our God any longer, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Well, nobody, but I don't know how many people have actually heard him speak from the fire and die either. Well, maybe Moses, actually, he listened to them, heard it from the fire, and he lived from the burning bush. But verse 27, go near, they say to Moses, and hear all that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you, and we will hear and do it. What did they propose? In light of what they felt, in light of what they had seen, they make a proposal. They propose that Moses continues to speak to them. Now, they're willing to listen to Moses. Now, up until this point, they've grumbled against Moses. They've fought against Moses. They've been stubborn in response to Moses. But now that they're terrified, they say, Moses, uh, you, 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 you speak. Um, Moses, uh, you listen to the voice of God. You've actually gone up in that mountain and you've not died. So you be the one who speaks to, to Jehovah and, and, we'll, and we'll hear what you have to say. You come tell us. Now this was probably a great encouragement to Moses. Who has had nothing but trouble from these people. And now they're asking him to play the role that he's already been playing. To take that role of mediating between God and them. It was probably a great encouragement to him at that point. I don't know if anybody was thinking, if anybody's going to die, let it be Moses. I don't think that's really in their minds. I, there, there's really a sense in which they are asking Moses to fill a, a remarkable role. Now just a little side note here. I think many of the brethren have experienced this. All those people who mock you constantly or ignore you constantly for being Christian... When they come close to death, how often do they come to you and ask you to pray and ask you to help them? So stay the course. Like Moses, stay in your place. Stay the course because it may be that your time is yet to come to serve God in ministering to those people. Just a little side note there. But we come back then, it really is re quite remarkable that they ask Moses to do this besides the fact that they've been grumbling at him but they fear being consumed by the voice. But notice this, they still want to hear from God. They want to hear God's voice. They've recognized that God has spoken and they want to keep hearing that. They don't want to lose a relationship with God. And so they recognize that in order for that to continue to happen... They will need a mediator. They will need somebody to play that role in between them. Now, this is a very, very good thing for them to do because it's not going to be long before they're going to need a mediator. And so in a sense, they're doing the right thing. So they propose that Moses be the mediator and they keep hearing from God, but only through him. They also propose, from the Deuteronomy passage, that they continue, that, that God let them continue to live. The way that it's, it's said there is, you know, they, they fear dying. They fear that if God keeps speaking, they'll, they'll be consumed. And so they're trying to set something in place where they can continue to have a relationship with this God through this mediator and therefore continue to live. They're fearful of dying, but they want to live. Just because they haven't died yet doesn't mean they will continue to live. You know, I don't think that they're thinking about their fickleness, but I think God knows. I know God knows their fickleness. And God knows that, yes, I continue to live near you, and you very well could die. Because you're so sinful you're going to turn and you're going to find yourself at the wrong end of my wrath. So although they are afraid, they don't want to lose contact with God. And notice what they say, in, again, in that, in that Deuteronomy passage, Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 24, Jehovah, our God, not your God, Moses, 
our God. And they say it twice. Speak to us all that Jehovah, our God, will speak. They've got it. This God is their God now. And they promise, they promise to obey, to hear his voice and do it. They want to hear from this God because they want to obey him. There's their proposal. Moses, you be the mediator. God, we still want a relationship with you through your mediator. Third point, what they received. What was the response? What, was the, what did they get when they made this proposal? Well, they got an encouragement, an explanation, and they got what they asked for. They get an encouragement, an explanation, and they got what they asked for. First of all, they received encouragement. Moses says to them in Exodus 20 and verse 20, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. God didn't bring you out here to kill you. God brought you out here to covenant with him. God, God destroyed the, the, the Egyptians and God delivered you from Egypt and, and God been with you throughout the, the wilderness journey and God's kept you alive by providing water for you and food for you and even when you've been stubborn and rebellious, he's forgiven you and he's kept with you and continued to help you because he wants to enter into covenant with you. So there's no need for them to fear. Just like Moses back in Exodus chapter 14 when they're standing at the Red Sea and they're, they're blocked in as the Egyptians are bearing down upon them. What did Moses say to them when they quaked and trembled and were ready to give up? He said, do not fear. Don't be afraid. God's taking care of you. This is why he's come. So they receive this encouragement in the form of comfort. They also receive a commendation. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 28, we read of that commendation. The Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all they have spoken. Now get this. This thunderous voice that spoke out of the clouds, this thunderous voice that spoke out of the fire, listened to them. He listened to them. When they spoke back, when they came back with this proposal, when they said they were afraid to die, when they said they wanted to keep that relationship, God heard them. His ear was open to their righteous request. And God commends their disposition. All that they said, they have spoken well. You know, he doesn't condemn them for their excessive fear. You're not, he doesn't say... Come on, you're not going to die. Ever disciplined your child and had to tell them that? You're killing me. You're not going to die. The purple of the wound is not going to kill you. No, you're not going to die. They could, he could have said that, but he didn't. He just commends them for their righteous fear. A due reverence, an appropriate awe of God's glory and greatness is appropriate even for a God who comes with gracious purposes. So their response was a good response as they <laughs> respond with this proposal. They receive this encouragement from Moses and from God. The second, they receive an explanation back in Exodus chapter 20. What is God doing? He says, do not, Moses says, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. God came the way that he did in order to put his fear in them. In order to impart to them a sense of who he is. He came to them in order to test them. The same word is used in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. When God tests Abraham by asking him for his only son. Are you going to believe me? That I have covenant purposes and I'm going to keep my covenant promises. Are you going to believe me? It's used in Exodus chapter 16 when they're given the manna and they're told six days you can go out. But you don't on the sixth day you choose you collect twice as much. It was meant to be a test for them. 
God was giving them an opportunity to prove themselves faithful. Not so much to him as much as to themselves. To show them that they could accomplish they could, they should, what they should do and that they could stand firm. He came to test them, to prove their faith. But he did that in order that the fear of him may remain with them. You see, he didn't want them to forget. He didn't want them to forget any more than my father wanted me to forget. With the snapping of a little piece of leather, which produced all kinds of fear, and I could still hear that sound. I didn't ever have to get disciplined. The sound alone was enough to make me remember that hurt. And God came in such a way that they might continue to have fear, but a believing fear, not a, not, a, not a carnal, unbelieving fear, not a fear that leaves them hopeless, a fear that's born out of faith. That though they stood and this God spoke to them in such terrifying circumstances, they did not die. That's what he wants them to remember. And he wants them to remember it so that, it goes on in Exodus 20 and verse 20, so that they may not sin. God is doing all of this to preserve them from sinning, just like my father when he would tell me to go out and he'd get that real stern look. You better be back by 10. And you knew it. When dad spoke that way, you knew he meant it. God has come with all the manifestations that he can to try to impress upon his people who he is as the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, the God of heaven and earth, this great and glorious God who has drawn near to them to covenant with them, but they should not take him lightly. And they are to live and not sin. This is a very serious thing. Now, people don't really take God lightly, do they? Do, do people really take their gods lightly? Well, think about what the Egyptians did. These, these, this, this is a real God. This is not a God that just eats a little bit of fruit that's thrown at him in a temple, which, in fact, the priests ate after everybody left. This is not some little God who, who, who sits on a little stand in my home and gets bumped over every once in a while by some mischievous, mischievous child who's not going to sit still and not keep his hands to himself. This is not a God like one of those. This is the real thing. This is the real God. And he wants them to understand that and to keep that in mind. And he's got heavenly expectations. He tells them why he's doing this. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29, I'm not sure exactly how to read this, except I read it as a parent. And I wonder if God is saying this. I get the impression God is saying this like a parent. He says, Deuteronomy 5, 29, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. He knows what they're like. He knows how soon this is going to fade. He understands how fickle they can be. This fear was meant to mark God's people always. This fear was meant to produce or promote universal obedience always. This fear and universal obedience were to be were to result in their enjoyment of God's favor for each subsequent generation that obeyed God. They received an explanation. They also received, thirdly, what they asked for. Verse 21, the people stood at a distance and Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. They got their mediator. Well, the first thing they got, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 30, is they got a, an honorable discharge. They got an honorable dismissal. God says, tell them to go back to their tents. 
that they're, they're uncomfortable in my presence. I can understand that. Send them back to their tents. I don't think that's a dismissal of any kind of uh, chastisement. It's just go back to their tents. They also got their faithful mediator. We read not only what it said in Exodus 20, 21, but Deuteronomy 5, 31. But as for you, God speaking to Moses singularly, stand here by me that I may speak to you all the commandments and statutes and the judgments which you shall teach them that they may observe them in the land which I give them to possess. I'm going to give them what they want. I'm going to give them a faithful mediator. I'm going to give them somebody to stand between me and them and to receive my words and to impart those words to them. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 32 to 33, they get some very clear direction. Here's some, some overarching but clear perspectives. So you shall observe. And now the you here is plural. So we're speaking to Moses in chapter 5 and verse 31. In chapter 5, verse 32 and 33, he's speaking to them. So you, the people, shall observe to do just as Jehovah your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live. They wanted to live. He says, I'll give you a path for life, and, that you may be, and it may be well with you, and that you may be may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Here's the clear direction. Global obedience. All of you are to obey. Precise obedience. Just as Jehovah your God has commanded you, don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. It's a straight path. Walk in it. And it's universal obedience. All the way. Walk in it. This is to be your course of life. God is setting your course for you. And he wants you to keep every single one of his commandments. And I'm going to give you what you want. You'll live. You'll live. Real life. Not just continue to live and prolong your days in a generic sense. But covenant life. You'll live in my presence. You'll live with my blessing. You'll live in the land that I'm giving you and promised to you, and you'll have it all. Here's his covenant dealings with them. As we look at this passage, then, as we've come up over the mountain, we, we've really not come to a, to a dry place. We've come up over the mountain, and now it's a vista that's opening up in front of us where we're going to see just how much God is embracing these people as His and giving them direction so they can enjoy that blessing. See the gospel picture here. God has redeemed His people. God draws His people out of bondage and brings them to Himself. Then He draws near to them. And he speaks to them fundamental laws for how to enjoy a co and maintain a covenant relationship with him and with one another. Now some dispensationalists, teachers in the past, have taught that the people of Israel should have said no to God when he offered them this covenant. When he came to them and said, now a covenant of works, you do this and live, they should have said, no thanks God. We'll stay with the promise you made to Abraham, which had no commitments. Well, it did, but the fact of the matter is, that would have been foolish. Because had they done that, they would have forfeited a covenant relationship with God, not maintained one. God was advancing his work in the earth, and he was advancing his promises, and describing how this was going to embrace a whole nation. And if they rejected this, if they turned aside at any point, they would forfeit their relationship with God. They would forfeit covenant with God. What can we learn from this? You know, as we've studied the Ten Commandments, I think pretty much all of us at one point or another, or at least I'm assuming so, it's true for me and the ones of you who have spoken to me, we've all come away from a sen with a sense of, wow, I can't do that. I, that whew, that's, that's almost overwhelming. This is an incredible God. This is, this is a glorious God. This is a great God. And he has set before us a standard which is just absolutely um, beyond me. It, it's unbendable. 
uh, it's, it, you, you can't negotiate any of it out. Uh, it's all there, and, and there's a sense of dread and fear as we come to this God who makes such commands and makes demands of us in this way. And it's meant to leave us with a sense of fear. This is a great God who has spoken to us. We must not take his words lightly. We must not think any one of these ten commandments is, is somehow less, than import, less important than others. That somehow we can look at these and say, you know, I, they're nice principles. Maybe we could live by them. I have to say, you know, this, this is born out of reading a commentator who supposedly, who used to be teaching at a, a notable, conservative, orthodox, I won't give the denomination, uh, seminary. And he was telling me, as I was reading him, that all of these commandments that God gave are just a little bit vague and hard to understand. Thou shalt not murder. I, I, I got it. He didn't. Mind-boggling. But that's the deceptiveness of our hearts, brethren. We hear these commands, and they're so clear, just like we've all said to our children, many of us have said to our children, what part of no don't you understand? What don't you understand? God has set it out plainly, clearly. He spoke to them. And the proper response is one of fear. Believing fear. This is an awesome God who has given us these commandments. But we ought not to fear death. Not if we're his children. Not for those of us who are part of his covenant community. There's no fear of death, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't need to fear condemnation. But we need to tremble before this God. That's the one who dwells with God. right? The prophet Isaiah said, he who trembles at my word. There needs to be that sense of trembling when we come to these commands that these are, these are incredible, these are, these are awesome, these are, these are fearful, they're great and, and magnificent and are to be kept. We need to manifest a godly fear. And it needs to be manifest, brethren. Godly fear is not just sitting back and going, oh, God said something. Godly fear is, God said it, I'm going to do it. All of it. I'm not turning aside to the right or to the left, no matter what circumstances present themselves to me. I'm not turning aside to the right or to the left because I can go off into a, a softer place. I'm not turning to the right or to the left because I think there's a better way to do it. I'm not turning to the right or to the left because I don't like anything he said. What he said, I do. I'm going to walk that straight line. And this is what every one of God's people needs to do. No picking, no choosing, no bending. Because God's law is fixed and clear. And remember the last words they heard. You shall not covet. He ends by going after their heart. It's the last thing they hear from the God who speaks from heaven. And that's one of the most fearful of the commands because it searches directly down into the depths of our hearts. They were to be righteous. We're to be righteous. God does not take lightly the flaunting of his law. God's people were, were to be so impressed with this that they would not sin. They were to be impressed with the power of this God, with the, with the glory of this God. They were to be impressed with how he controls all of the universe. Why? So that they would not be tempted to step aside from the slightest way from God's law. God calls us to be righteous. And when God calls a people to be righteous, he's making us over into his image. Now in the New Covenant, we, meet, we understand that that righteousness comes to us in Christ, and that that righteousness which we are given is now working out in us. We are being recreated in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We're being remade into the image of God in Christ. 
So if you have that righteousness, if there's any profession that you have that righteousness in you, then that righteousness better be working itself out in your life. And if it's not, then you better hurry and get back where you ought to be by repenting of your sins and going to Jesus Christ. This is what we're meant to do when we see this law. We're meant to see it as standard by which we live. But blessed be God. Excuse me. Every time I go to North Bergen, I get allergy attacks. Blessed be God. Our approach to God is not on the basis of our righteousness. It wasn't for them in one sense either. It was through the mediator. And as I said, it was a blessed thing that they had a mediator because pretty soon they're going to deviate so far off from God's law, they are going to make a golden calf. I don't think any of them on this particular day was thinking, you know, we might make a golden calf once this is over. I think we'll have our own feast someday and we'll just... Ignore what God tells us. I don't think any of them were thinking that at this point, but it's not going to be long before they're making a golden calf and they are turning aside from God and it's only going to be the prayers of the mediator that is going to preserve them. And so it is with us, brethren. Blessed be God, there's a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he stands ready to hear our cries and to Mediate between us and God and forgive our sins. He is the one who speaks to us on behalf of God. Luke chapter 9 and verse 35 on the Mount of Transfiguration. Some very interesting description is given by God of Jesus. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Here's the one who speaks on, on my behalf. Here's the great prophet to whom you need to listen. We recently looked at the crucifixion and all the darkness and all the, the, the challenges that came on that day. And you know what? Interestingly enough, one of the passages that is fulfilled at the crucifixion is Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verses 30 to 32. One of the few places where some of these words that what was taking place at Mount Sinai are again used to describe another event. He says, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before a great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors, among the Lord, the, excuse me, whom the Lord calls. There was another day when God broke into history, brethren. When he came down and stood upon a mount, it wasn't Sinai, it was Calvary. And he stood there on Golgotha. He stood there and there he ratified a new covenant. And it was a terrifying day for the earth shook and the heavens stood still and they were black. And it was like the smoke that was rising up again and was blotting it all out because God had come into this world and it was a terrifying thing when he poured his wrath out upon his son. But brethren, he came in grace. He came that he might have a people for himself and he might covenant with them and be able to draw them in and keep them close through the blood of his son. Now, some of you may sit back and say, oh, you know, there they go again, all that gospel stuff and the things that happened at the cross. And, oh, that's kind of neat. I know the story, but no big deal. You know, if you thwarted God on the day that he came down and spoke at Mount Sinai, if you turned aside from what God was doing that day, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, you could be put to death. Oh, there's no God up there. Who's Jehovah? He's nothing. Blasphemy laws were very strict. Or if you thwarted it, say, I'll go up on the mountain, you could have died that very day. Now you may not die immediately when you thwart and you dismiss and you ignore what God did 
on the cross on Golgotha that day when he came into this world. And you may dismiss it and think lightly of it and pass over it and say, oh, wow, well, yeah, he's making all kinds of connections. I don't think they're really there. But my friend, one day you'll find out that it's true. That day was a terrifying day, but it was a terrifyingly glorious day. And if you don't draw near to God as he came to us in Christ on the cross on that day, then you have no hope. But if you draw near to him as he came in Christ, you have hope. You have hope of your sins being forgiven. You have hope of drawing near to this God. You have the hope of being one with this God. That's the, that's the great gospel pictured there at Sinai. A covenant of works? I think not. A covenant of grace. When God drew near in gracious power to give his people what they needed to live and enjoy him forever. But brethren, let us not take lightly the law of this God. For it was that law that was vindicated on that day on Calvary. When he died upon the cross, he died because the law had been broken. He kept the whole law. He kept it for us. Now it's for us to keep it by his grace in his power to show our love and our commitment to him. May God help us. May God help us to see all that God has done. Let's pray. Father, be merciful to us and help us to see the glory of your gospel and the grace of your law. Please take your words and make them living and vital words to transform each of us for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.